It's that time of year, you know, storms, all those bad things start developing in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> hey guys, what's going on? This is Jason with JW Classic VW, and we are back, back in the garage, back in the vlog, and we're talking about fuel systems this, uh, this week, actually part two to the EFI fuel system. And I want to show you some of the stuff that's been going on, and I'm going to get right into the intro and then right into the content, but let me turn you around real quick and show you some of the cool stuff I've been working on. Yeah, if you guys tune into my social media, you know, Facebook group or the Instagram. You've kind of seen this already. This is a custom fuel pump bracket that I've been working on. Yeah, we're gonna talk about what I did to make that and why I put it here after the uh, intro. And also we're gonna talk about all the stuff we've been doing with this EFI fuel system, including that right there. Oh baby. Yeah, hard lines, bends, we're gonna get into that. Right after this intro, we're gonna talk about some of the tricks I used to bend these hard lines and get everything to look the way that I wanted to look because you guys are like, how did you get it to look like that? Well, for one, I'm not using stainless steel. <laughs> Those guys out there used to stainless steel, you guys are like uh, my heroes because it's a pain in the butt to bend that. I'm using copper nickel guys, which is perfect for EFI fuel systems. And this is a 3 8 nickel copper. If you're interested in that information, check out the description below. But after this intro, guys, get into some cool stuff, some updates too. We're going to talk about the Berg 5-speed transmission. I got the nose in. You know, the nose that I was waiting on to be able to start mocking stuff up? Yeah. So after the intro, lots of cool stuff, guys. See you in a second. Okay, so like if you missed that on part one of the fuel system, I, I have this whole custom bracket that I came up with, you know, this one over here that I'm kind of showing on the video right now. Custom bracket for running my, my main hard lines from the front of the fuel tank to the back of the car up underneath here. And so I'm gonna show you guys real quick, we can get up underneath there and show you what I'm talking about and what I did to kind of make that. And then we'll get into like all the other stuff that's going on. So let's go underneath the car, guys. Yeah, so like I was telling you guys, in part one of the EFI fuel system for this turbo build, I went ahead and started my hard lines up here and used the uh, brake bracket, this brake bracket right there, to actually act as the bracket for my uh, bulkhead fittings. I have some bulkhead 45s right here where my hard lines start. And let's go ahead and transition underneath the car. Yep, and here is underneath the car, guys, where you see the hard lines that go down inside the channel where I use my custom brackets to hold those in place. I do have to finish up a couple places to fit, you know, complete the holding of these things in, in here, which is like right in this area where it transitions up to this spot. But I have plenty of kind of like slack to get these good to go. Let me go ahead and show you that custom, uh, shoot, custom fuel pump bracket up front. Yeah, let's take a look at that. So I'm sure some of you guys are gonna be like, well, how exactly did you come up with the idea for that bracket, Jay? Well, simple guys, like with any of this custom work, it started with some paper or some cardboard to make up a template first. And that's what I have. You can see that this is kind of how the rough idea happened. You know, I just 
drew it out, got my dimensions, figured out where I wanted my fuel filter to be, and then I cut it out of some plate steel. I got this plate steel like Home Depot or Lowe's, one or the other, and it's just some, uh, what is it, uh, quarter inch? Let me see, what is this? What, what is this? I don't know, it's rubbed off. <laughs> it, it's, it's like quarter inch plate steel, so it's easy to work with. I just used my grinder, cut out what I had to cut out, drilled some holes, tapped a couple holes for uh, some threads because I have a tap. Yeah, I have a bunch of these like taps like this that I just drill through and then tap it as it's drilling through. These are pretty cool. And then I have plenty of like M8 hardware all over the freaking place with these nice little Torx bits on there. Yeah. So I made up the bracket, sanded, sanded it down, and uh, you guys already saw that. <laughs> sanded it down and then painted it. You know, a few coats of primer, a few coats of gloss black. I still got to take it out and then kind of like use some 400 grit, wet sand it, and then hit it again with another gloss coat of black and then hit it with that X2 clear coat. Cool stuff, guys. So the way this all works is the fuel tank is going to be in here, of course. And then from the fuel tank down into this 100 micron fuel filter, which is good for E85 because it has a stainless strainer inside of it, it's going to transition up into actually through this hole right there, up into the fuel pump. And then from the fuel pump, it'll go back down through this hole to my hard lines over there, guys. Those hard lines over there, yeah. But what I did is I didn't want to mount the fuel pump kind of like crazy here. So sometimes, well, that bracket's just kind of like sitting there. <laughs> sometimes these fuel pumps can be pretty loud. And the one that I was going to use, which I'm not using anymore, was a CB Performance, which had this huge isolator on it. And you know, from what I've heard, they're a little bit noisy, but I found out when I called CB to ask some questions about that actual fuel pump, that it won't work that well for E85 and the kind of horsepower I'm trying to pull with this engine. So I went ahead and got a Bosch 004. And if you guys are into E85 fuel systems, you know probably about the Bosch 004 fuel pump, which can handle like up to 600 horsepower on its own. <laughs> All right, so I went ahead and used these. I think what they were was like a stabilizer bushing that I pulled off of a, uh, I don't know, some other car way back in the day. And uh, I just shaved them down, you know, like with a, with a sander, shaved them down so that they would fit nice and even here on the, uh, the front of the body also took these out while I was doing this and painted them up because they're all kind of rusty. <laughs> okay, so now that we're in the car, in Goose, let me talk to you about some of the other stuff I've been doing. And I'm gonna bring you up underneath Goose and show you kind of like the whole setup, but I wanna explain first, kind of give you guys a better idea why things are being set up the way they are on Goose because her EFI system is not like the normal one that you probably have seen, you know, where it's just like one line that kind of goes into a manifold then jumps over to another manifold and then hits back to the return. We got a lot of extra line jazz going on here. And I'm sure you guys are like, what's that all about? I wanted my fuel regulator to be outside so I could get to it easily, right? To make adjustments. And, and you know, that's gonna be something that's gonna happen from time to time where you're gonna have to adjust your fuel regulator. Well, hopefully just one time. You, you set it when you're at the tuner and it's good to go, but who knows? It might change, I don't know. But I wanted it to be easily accessible. Plus this looks pretty cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain why I have bulkhead fittings on both sides. Why do I have four bulkhead fittings going into my, what's going to be my manifolds? Hmm. Well, let's get a little closer and I'll show you guys what's going on there. Right. All right, guys. We're a little bit closer now. Uh, what we have here is some CB fuel injected uh, manifolds, right? Right here. Ooh, all ported up. Nice for turbo application. And then we have this custom topper. This manifold topper or manifold fuel rail combination of greatness all in one and you can see that on this rail just like on both of these you've got a return and then the feed side and you can see down there that's why i have two bulkhead fittings on either side of this engine bay well jay what's that mean what what, what the heck's that all about well what we have here is independent feed and return on both sides of the engine now, this is something that was designed specifically for this application. And you're, you're, you're going to see different things on different turbo setups, like as many different Volkswagen turbo setups, you're going to find as many combinations. There's only a few like standard sets that I've seen out there that are kind of like follow the same idea. And that's at the dub shop and CB Performance, of course, because they mass produce these bad boys. But when you want to go custom, 
like this one here from Race Engineering with Daryl. And I've talked to you guys before about Daryl Howard and some of the outstanding stuff that he builds, like this engine, my EFI turbo engine. He built that sucker, man. Fantastic. 300 plus horsepower monster. Yeah. So that's why I've got the fuel lines like this. Now let's go up underneath the car. Let me show you the business side, the, the underneath here. Show you what's going on with all that. Okay. <laughs> we are up underneath the car now, guys, and kind of showing you everything that's going on because it's a lot. It's a lot. I know. I know you're like... What's going on? I put the uh, Kaffir bar top support back in place here after lubing up the threads and everything so I could have it as in, in, in place because I got to mock up some other things that come into play here. But first off, I got all these supports I put in and I also added this support and I'll show you guys real quick kind of like what I did to make this. So I'm taking you away from the, this part of the video and then into the how I made this little bracket because some of you guys might want to know what's going on with that. So see you in a second, guys. Be right back. I want to put this up into place and then... uh. We'll talk a little, a little bit more about what's going on back here after the after this uh, little break video. All right, guys, before I get into showing you how to do some of these bends and the kind of the way I figured it out, let me take you away from the video for one second to remind you, don't don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, guys. If you're enjoying the content and you're getting some kind of value, or you just like watching me sweat my, you know, my head off down here and showing you guys all my EFI stuff, then like, share, and subscribe, guys. Now, back to the video. So I just got a piece of blank 16 gauge I'm using here. I've cut all kinds of different stuff out of this and used it for different things. Cut this little piece here. What I end up doing is folding this portion here that'll hold up against the body on Goose Run. We use a rib nut to hold this in place. But my idea was is to go ahead and install a, a bulkhead fitting, a straight, a, a dash 6AN bulkhead fitting so that this can hold the line on the return side. You guys will see what I mean once I get this kind of like set up mocked up and then uh, i gotta clean it up i'm gonna round off the edges and stuff and get it into place and get a better idea of where it needs to be but uh first off we'll drill the hole take it up over there do some measurements and then get it set up for where i need to cut the fold cool all right guys let's go ahead and drill a hole So with anything that's been custom so far with this fuel line set up, what I'm going to end up doing is actually cutting this back a little bit here to give me the room that I'm going to need. When I take this bulkhead fitting up in here and I actually put it on the fuel line, like a lease. Get that on there. Come on, baby. Don't be so mean. There we go. You can see, like, once I have this in position where I want it to be, and it's going to be like, like that and held in place. It's awfully close to the to the to the shock top of this tower here. So I'm going to take it and cut it back some, so that I can go ahead and move this back. This anything custom like this, it's it's always better to give yourself a little bit more length because I've already had to remake lines I don't know how many times. So what I'm going to do. Take that line back to about right there so you can see that i'll have more room when it comes to the connection because the return line right here is going to go up and over and down this other side like this so i'm going to take the tape measure put it up where it needs to be in place and measure the center line and it looks like it is right at about an inch and a half so that makes it pretty easy so inch and a half is where i need to make my bend center off the actual uh fitting the uh bucket fitting so it'll be like this actually that'll be like this <laughs> and then bend it right about there cool all right let's go ahead and uh, bend the bracket real quick first like uh we measured underneath inch and a half from the center of the hole I'm just gonna score it real quick. You can use like a marker if you got it, if that's what you feel like using. 
so just generally just close to the center is where I'm, I'm looking for and then an inch and a half now let's protect the side that we're trying to keep pretty because <laughs> we're gonna have to cut this probably too because we're not gonna need this whole piece here So with 16 gauge steel, simple as just knocking it over. Just like a so. There we go. Neat. All right, there we go. The bracket's in place. I'm gonna tell you what. This custom work. Guys, I don't know if you hear me breathing heavy at all, <laughs> but it's a pain in the butt, man. It really is. It's worth it in the end because you look at it and you're like, man, I really, you know, I made something really cool. But yeah, it's a pain in the butt. So you, after it got painted, it's super smooth. You know, it's not powder coated, but uh, it's fine. Three or four coats of uh, primer, three or four coats of gloss black, good to go. And we got a custom bracket. And what that helps do. This provides a nice stable position for everything to mount. Just like the rest of the fuel lines are all super stable now because of the extra mounting I put in. Let me go ahead and show you what I did and give you a rundown of uh, all the mounting locations that help keep this hardline system stable. So yeah, like here's my view from laying down on the ground. <laughs> you can notice that we have quite a few lines going on here, guys. And it's not perfectly straight up underneath here. There's like, you know, some of the gaps are a little off, but you know, good enough for government work, I think is the saying. I added some aluminum spacers here when I mounted these uh, little clamps to help offset the distance because it kind of would have sucked it close to the body and I didn't want that to happen. I'm also gonna add a, uh, a C channel seal like a, a little c, c channel use like on um, doors and stuff like that right there on that channel because i'm kind of worried about maybe there being some wear on the lines where it rests against it so it'll rest against that rubber instead this t right here the the t that you see is where the feed comes in the main supply and then of course that's the return over there and the return comes from the uh, fuel regulator cool yeah so you see sorry about the bounce against guys it's uh, I'm kind of holding this thing up underneath the car you see I got all kinds of bends all kinds of angles all kinds of crazy stuff going on here and I still have two more things I, I gotta get up in into this bad boy the uh, the 10 micron filter which I ended up not using I'm not gonna use the bigger one that I have I got a smaller one on its way something like a three inch by like one inch 10 micron filter and then I have the flex fuel sensor that's going to be on back here. So those two are still going here. Plus the uh, fuel pressure sensor is also going to be back here. So I got to figure all that out still and then uh, get the soft lines up to those and then the soft lines into the hard lines because there's going to be a soft line transition at the tank down to the hard lines and a soft line transition here back in this area because this is where the hard lines come back. Soft line transition from here up to the hard lines. I think it's kind of a good idea to have a little bit of flex or play in the system, you know, just for fuel pressure so you don't have hard lines everywhere. Plus, you know, for body movement, engine movement, it'll keep the uh, hard lines secure after everything gets locked down. And then uh, I think it's not a bad idea to have some, some flex lines in here. So you're curious, huh? You're curious about how the heck I got all these bends to work, what I used. I've kind of gone over the tools a little bit, but let's go up to the bench and I'll talk to you guys about how I made these bends repeatable. Because that's the real, the real difficult part is the 90s. I mean, I got 90s all over the place, but how do you get these 90s to where you're not remaking lines 50 times? I'm gonna tell you what, man. Like this first started off on the other side. Like I had both these T's over there on that side and then I had to flip it and then recut one of the lines to a different length. And there's been all kinds of reflaring and adjustments made. So don't think that this was easy. This took like a couple weeks to kind of like get this all situated. So let me take you up to the bench and tell you kind of like what I used for my system and what I figured out 
to make repeatable 90 bends and then show you some of the other kind of bends like these these ones up here like these ones like they kind of move stuff out of the way because i had to move this back the fitting had to come back some because it was too close to that shock tower so i had to figure out how to do that too you know because it bends back to the body and then bends back straight again so let me show you what i had to do to figure that out all right guys well there has been numerous questions oh i probably have to sand these down too dang it numerous questions on how i did the bending on the uh, 3 8 fuel line and let me tell you what use both of these benders for sure the whole process was a uh, pain in the butt i got all kinds of different things here showing that <laughs> evidence of that pain in the butt so i had to adjust lanes multiple times and when you do that you're you're going to be cutting and reflaring ends and I, I just kept these just to kind of show people what you know that uh it took me a lot of work to get everything where i got it <laughs> these different lines down here were just like pieces that i had to cut off to reshore and stuff i used this piece right here to kind of set up and line up where my 90s were because you can't just bend a 90 if you don't know where the 90s are going to end up and what i mean by that is like i took my my uh, bender here and this is how you get a uh repeatable bend or a repeatable length it, where you understand is i put the zero and then i mark my zero my 45 and the 90 on this pipe so that i knew where everything was okay so that way when i put a pipe in here i knew kind of like where i was gonna end up having to to mark or where i had to start my bends zero was always my reference so whenever i mark a piece of pipe I knew that the zero was where I needed to mark that pipe and start my bend. What do I mean by all this? Let me bring you guys down a little bit closer and show you what I'm talking about. So just for example purposes, I'm going to put my old empty breather box up here. And let's go ahead and take a piece of pipe, this piece of pipe here, and say that we're wanting to bend into this thing and not use up too much extra here. So there's two kind of measurements that you're going to want. You're going to want the measurement off, how far out you want to come, or like a rough idea, and then the measurement too. So we're going to be going, let's just say, okay, let's get another beta box down here. Let's say you've got these two breather boxes, right? And you want to interconnect these two with 90s, like a 90 off and a 90 in. And you only want to come off as much as you have to, which what that means is you have to have so much of a 90 to be able to get a fitting on here. Because if you don't have enough on there, you're not going to be able to put the 37 degree flare right so you want to keep it as tight as you can we can start off with that and i can tell you for instance like this pipe right here is about as tight as you can get on a 90 and still get the fitting on there with the with doing your flare and let me show you what i mean so like if you put this in here and you can measure all this if you want to kind of get off get all of your ideas of what you need to have to make repeatable bends especially if you're doing this all the time. But for me, this is a one-time one deal with Goose. So if the fitting was on here, it would just be enough because this bend right here, you can't get that ferrule past the bend. You can get the other end of it, like the, the part that screws down, the, uh, the end fitting. But the ferrule that's on here, that sucker won't go past this bend. So you have to have just enough space there and then still be able to get this flush on top. So once that's flush on top, you're good to go. But this is about as tight as you want it to be able to be and when you're looking at the or this is about as tight as it can be when you're looking at this say like on your bender all this matters when you go to to actually do the bend because it'll you'll, you'll know that you only have so much length so let's go ahead and hit this real quick get this all the way to the 90 which it is and you there you go you see and this is a kind of a good piece to have as an example because it'll tell you exactly what your limitations are. So a lot of these pieces right here, that's exactly what they are. They're, they're uh, like demos or the ability for me to make a repeatable bend. So from here, let's get these closer. From this uh, output to this output right there, we need to be able to make the bend to get into there for it to be right. Let me bring it above so you guys can see what's going on. All right, so now we're above. You guys can see a little bit better what I'm talking about. 
So what you would do is you would take your example pipe and you could lay this right straight with where you need it to be. So I back this up a little bit. So that's where you need your bend to be. You bring this pipe in, your pipe that you're bending, and you'll know that I need to mark this pipe right here, and this is the zero position. That's, woo, zooming you guys in. That's what you need to know to be able to have a bend that makes sense to where it needs to be. All right, so you'll mark that with a marker. I had a marker on here somewhere. I don't know what the heck that went to. Hold on. I think I'll find that marker real quick. So, of course, my uh, marker walked off. So I'm just going to use a piece of tape to mark this real quick. You back this up to right here so you have an idea where it needs to be. Your bend, your zero, needs to start right there. And then what I was also doing is I was putting a little arrow on the pipe so I knew which way I was bending. Because, like, two or three times, man, I bent the wrong direction. I was like, oh, and I just ruined the pipe. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let me break this off a little bit. There we go. I'm going to bend this thing, and then we can see how it lines up. This is a little kink, so we'll see how it works out with the bending of it. And I was marking all the way around these pipes so that I knew exactly where I had to bend. What I mean by that is like when you bring this in here, like I was telling you, you want to have an arrow pointing the direction you're going. Like right now, I know that I'll be bending down, and this is the right direction. So we'll line the tape up with a zero. And we'll see how this turns out. Don't make me a liar, tape. All right, so we got our bend, and it's all wonky because I had this thing sitting weird. Let's just see if it's close to where it's supposed to be. Hey, hey, hey. That's pretty good, pretty good. Of course, you'd have to measure and cut this to where it needs to be the length. But yeah. And then, uh, this is off because I didn't have this completely straight when I bent this. Ooh. But look it, I could, I could straighten it out. You know why I was able to do that? Because this is freaking copper nickel. You try to do that with some stainless steel, good luck, buddy. <laughs> and there you go. And if you're not perfectly lined up, you can kind of like bend it out just a little bit to get it lined up. But yeah, that's the idea, guys. I hope that's helpful for somebody out there. If you're starting to bend some pipes, it does help to have some examples. The most important one was the 90. Now, let's take, for instance, you're having to get around something. Like, you saw all the crazy eccentric bends I had down there. Some of the ones that kicked out and then came back to and then went back around or down and up. Yeah, that took all kinds of practice. But this little bender right here helped out a lot with that. It allows you to, let's say, you're going straight. Let's say I'm going straight here. And, and I want to come up above here and then come back out straight. So you got a piece of pipe and you want to hit like a 15 degree and then come back another 15 degrees. So you're bending. So if I bend this way, that's going the wrong direction. So this right here is going to kick me out or kick the pipe out. See? Kick it like a, that's probably like a 30, 30 degree, right? You see? That's where that comes in handy. But then what you want to be able to do is come back on straight, right? And you take your pipe and you want to pretty much bend the same type of angle. And you can see like when you're looking at the pipe here, you're waiting for this pipe to straighten back up with the other pipe. And that's pretty close. You're waiting for the end to straighten up with the, the, the back side. See? And now you have a way to get around stuff. And that's where this one came in handy. Alright, okay, so that's, that's plenty of talking about 
defending EFI lines. And guys, let me tell you what, this copper nickel stuff is like magic. So whoever came up with it, thank you very much. Because like I told you, the stainless steel, holy spagolis. It's time for a bird update, guys. It's, uh, I got the nose cone in. And just the nose cone because Dave Fult is still working on the keys and everything before I can send off my transmission. But he sent me the nose cone because I can start the mock-up and kind of getting everything into place where it needs to be. But I wanted to show you guys this because it's super cool. Let me bring you down a little closer so you can see what's going on. All right, we now have the aerial view. I think I'm lining these up right so you can get a better idea of what I'm talking about. So if you take the straight edge across the bottom of these two, you'll see that the early model one actually has the input shaft kind of lower, about an inch or so lower. And what that helps out with is the alignment the alignment of the transmission as it goes in. Because let me tell you what, you're gonna be cutting up your chassis, which I'm still gonna to have to do some modifications, some cutting to the torsion tube underneath there to get this portion right here to seat up to where it needs to be. And that's just unavoidable. Dave said he's tried all kinds of different things to, to make it as minimal as possible of like modifications and like shaving this down. And he said, well, this is about as good as I can get. And I'm good with that, man. The least amount of modifications or the easier I can make this install, the better. Now I'm still gonna hold on to this nose cone because you never know what's gonna end up happening to a transmission. You know, I might end up upgrading to a different transmission at some point, you never know. There's a lot of really cool stuff out there. But with this nose cone modification, and like I told you, it's probably about 700 bucks or so with shipping for the four keys, the new hockey stick, and this new nose cone to allow you to relocate the uh, input shaft. Now that's also gonna help with your shift rod and your coupler alignment. And all you're really gonna have to do is figure out where your little dimple goes. You know, the little one you put the grub screw down on that shifts into this thing. So you have to play with that a little bit, but a lot less of a headache, guys. That's the update on the Berg 5-speed. Pretty cool. If you have any questions, ask me down below. And don't forget to check out the description because I'm gonna link Dave Foltz's information there for Foltz transmissions up in Ontario, Canada. Thanks, Dave. Love it, man. Well guys, that is gonna do it for this video, this episode, and I'm probably gonna have at least one more, who knows, maybe two more fuel system videos because there's a lot going on with this fuel system, as you guys can see, especially this particular one. And I'm not using like uh, any kind of haphazard install. I'm really trying to think this thing out for safety and, and, and for troubleshooting. I want it to be the best I can have it be with what I have available, right? I'm sure people could go crazy and just like get insanely eccentric, but uh, I'm detail-oriented too. I want things to look pretty. <laughs> That's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the content. I appreciate all my new subscribers. You guys are awesome. If you joined up, put some comments down below. Let me know where you're from. Woo, time to go upstairs and start working on this video. Yeah, <laughs> get out of the garage, guys. Have some fun with your cars. Enjoy them. You, you want to get them out running, right? So it's, it's about that time. It's about that time to start having some more car shows. See you guys in the next one, guys. This is Jason from JW Classic BW, and I'm out.